every action is sampled from a different Bernoulli distribution and you can have a belief for each parameter that is different. So that means that when we update, our posterior is basically the number of times we observe one for parameter alpha and the number of times we observe zero for parameter beta plus this initial parameter uh, alpha i or beta i. Okay? So there's a plus missing here, obviously. Uh, but that's it. Okay? So we could consider a more complicated thing where they're not independent. But it doesn't make a lot of sense in this setting. There's no reason to think that the average reward of one arm is somehow related to the average reward of another arm unless we have some strong information beforehand. Yeah. So if we know that, uh, let's say, two drugs are related because they target similar things, then we might expect that if one is good, then the other is probably also good. But if we just have no information whatsoever, then we just set everything as independent better distributions. Okay? Later we'll see another way to do it. Uh, this is, makes it easier for us to apply uh, this kind of stuff. So let's just see how, how I did it. Yeah, I. It's not very difficult. So let's see. Okay, so Thompson bar is basically first set up these things. And there's an initial parameter alpha and beta, which we can select. Normally I select is equal to one. And here we have the recommendation. If you already fit, you have your parameters, right? Now, because it's a vector form, you can basically do everything at the same time. So you sample the vector of thetas directly for every value of alpha and beta in those vectors. Uh, you could also do it with a loop if you wanted. But this will give you a vector of thetas. It's one sample from an independent better distribution. Okay, and then you select the maximizing theta as your action. Now if you want to get action probabilities, then you can quick and dirty do something like this. Select an action according to this function there I recommend and look at the average number of times you select the action. So this is just a very dirty way of doing it. Uh, but I don't know a better, of a better general way, to be honest. Now for the observation, you just need to do this, right? You have the action and the outcome. Increase alpha when outcome is 1 and, and increase beta when outcome is 0. So let's implement it like this. So that's all, the, that's all you need, yeah? Well, I guess this is strictly speaking true. So here I assume a lot of things about what the outcomes are and what the reward is, right? Again, if you say it's a reward, then you have to assume that the reward is either 0 or 1. Otherwise, this model doesn't work. So if the reward is negative, then the model doesn't work. Or if it's not 0, if it's 0 0.5, again, the model is not to be correct. No. So there are some assumptions about what the reward is and what the outcome is that are kind of hidden here. So this model is only directly applicable for the case where rewards are either 0 or 1. Um, it should be applicable, but yeah? Is there really a problem with the decimal? Yeah, so strictly speaking, the posterior distribution is not correct. Because the beta distribution that you estimate tells you the prob is, oh, right. is a prior for the Bernoulli, and the Bernoulli tells the probability of getting a 1 or a 0. It, doesn't, it gives zero probability for anything in between. So, in practice, a lot of people use this even for any other reward between 0 and 1. So if you observe 0 0.5, it's like somewhere between 1 and 0. But again, it's kind of different. So if you think about it like this, let's say you have one arm that gives you a 0 0.5 reward all the time, and you have another, an arm that gives you a 1 half of the time and a 0 half of the time. Then you should have a very different conclusion about the two arms, depending on which one is the case, right? In our case, because we only care about average reward, it doesn't matter so much. But if you wanted to do something slightly different, let's say 
the sum of exponential of rewards or something like that, then it would make a difference. So if you care really about the distribution of rewards. If you care about expected value, then it doesn't make a lot of difference. Uh, so you can still use this model. Even though it's not directly correct, you can still justify it by saying, I only care about the expected value of the reward, and this is what I'm all, instead of the actual reward. Yeah. Okay. Now, in general, you have a problem with this type of thing, because you have to specify a prior distribution for some models. So here we have taken this very simple model. It's nice, but in more general case, it's, it's harder to do, right? Yeah? Uh, uh, I was just thinking, uh, I mean, this, this works as long as the, the bandit either gives you money or doesn't give you money, but uh, the bandit could give you with 10% probability 1 and with uh, 0 0.1 probability it could give you 10. Like, it, like yeah. an actual machine? Yeah, yeah. So sometimes it gives you different, sometimes it gives you yeah. one. Yeah. And so this could be different for the, for the distribution. Yeah, so it could be different. So in that case, you can model that with some other distribution. So you could say, I assume it's normal distribution with unknown mean and variance for every app. Then you can have positive negative rewards. Or unknown gamma distribution, then it's positive rewards. You can choose anything you like, but still you have this assumption about what's the distribution like, right? So this is a nice simple case because uh, if you know the rewards are zero and one, it's natural to say Bernoulli. If you know it's some reward in the real numbers, then you still have to think about possible distributions, yeah, so uh, it's a bit harder. Now, the more general case, if you don't have to have, if you don't want to have a posterior, you could always use bootstrapping. So with bootstrapping, you basically have k different models, and then you, how could you implement Thompson sampling with bootstrapping, do you think? So what does the posterior tell you? What is the posterior actually? It's a distribution over models, right? And the bootstrap distribution is also a distribution over models. It's a finite number of models, and the distribution is defined from the data. But basically, each bootstrap sample gives you one model. Take another sample, you have another model. So you can implement tops of sampling by basically saying, well, instead of using better distribution, I'll use all my data, take a subsample, fit a model to that, and then act as though this model is correct. So you can do that. There's no, nobody's stopping you from this. The only problem is you have to store all your data. Ah, but uh, that's not a very big problem. But it's a very effective approach and actually works pretty well. Yeah. So before, so because it's not super relevant directly to your project, I will move to uh, an extension of this framework which is more applicable, okay? Because here we just have actions, and there's no observations, right? Which is a problem. Yeah. So, what happens if you have observations? So, you have an individual coming in at time t with some information, right? And you want to administer a treatment, at. So typically the treatment will depend on the individual's information. So maybe different genes or, or sex or smoking history will give you a different uh, intervention that you should do. And then after you do the intervention, you observe an outcome. Again, let's say we have some utility defined somehow and we want to maximize its expectation. Uh, the simplest kind of problem is this one. You have xt, let's say it's a real number, and you have an action, at. And then your reward distribution basically is coming from some model where the reward only depends on the current action and the person's information and nothing else. Okay? So two standard examples is the linear binding problem where you have a finite number of actions, one, two, three, four, okay? And every action defines a vector uh, representing something about the action. And the data of the person is also another vector. So then what you get is a reward that an expectation has a value equal to the dot product of the action vector and the person's vector. Now, if you know the action vector, then you're fine. You know exactly how well you're going to do the reaction. Yeah. 
But if you don't, you have a problem. You have to basically test the action every time. Okay? So now, whether or not you get information about the action that is interesting also depends on the vector x. Okay? So if the action, if the vector x is zero everywhere that has a single one somewhere, then you only get information about one parameter value in the parameter vector for the action, right? Because you have like theta one times x one, right? Plus blah blah blah. Theta k times x k for your specific action. So if all the x's are zero apart from one x, then you only get information about that theta, right? If more x are one or, or not zero anyway, then you get information about all of the x at the same time, right? But you you have to disentangle them somehow. Yeah. So this is not directly trivial and to do, but you can do it basically. Uh, least squares problem, uh, more or less. For clinical trials, the reward is not necessarily something that is normally distributed, right? So you might have the same kind of formalization where you have a linear parameter uh, multiplied by a vector of the observations, and the parameter vector depends, is determined by your action. And now instead of observing this thing, which is normally distributed, you observe either a zero or a one. So you have less information, so positive or negative result. And the distribution is logistic, like in logistic regression, the same thing. Okay. So you have again exactly the same thing as before. The only difference is now that there's, there are more parameters and the inference problem is slightly harder, okay? But you could still do it uh, if you wanted. In this particular example, there is a conjugate prior, like the beta Bernoulli prior, for which you can get a distribution for the thetas. Yeah, it's a normal gamma prior, it's called. So you can find it on Wikipedia, it tells you how to do it, okay? And this one, there's no clause for solution, I think. Um, or maybe there is, uh, actually. Mm, I think there should be because, I don't know, there's no clause for solution because this is basically a kind of uh, Bayesian logistic regression problem. So for every theta, for every action A, you're basically solving a logistic regression problem. And you have uncertainty about the parameters. And this parameter ascendancy, you can express it, let's say, with a Gaussian distribution, but we know that this is not expressible in closed form. Yeah. So right now, if you want to do this, you have to use, uh, use approximations. But here, you can express a distribution about theta a in terms of a normal distribution as well. Okay, so that's the basic idea for contextual buckets. Uh, it's easier to think about contextual buckets in the framework we had already, right? So, let's maybe just go through it a little bit. Okay, so let's say now we want to have contextual bandit. Okay. And you want to use the same idea of, of Thompson sampling. I'll just start this code and I probably don't finish it. But now we have a number of outcomes, number of actions, and number of observations, right? Uh, let's say that there's a finite number of possible observations. So to make it very simple, it's not going to be true, of course, in reality, but let's say we have it. So if it's not true in reality, we could, in theory, do use clustering to discretize everything and then use the same model. There's nobody forbidding us from doing that, okay? Okay. So now we want to have this stuff, but now we have for every action and every observation, there's a different probability, right? So the probability of every outcome depends on both the action and the observation. So if you have k observations and n actions, it's k times n. So you have a k n matrix 
for every parameter. Yeah. Fine. Okay. So then, if we wanted to use top sampling, it's not very difficult. Now, let's forget about this part. We don't care so much. So this is the more interesting part. Now, this should probably work. I don't know. Is the correct sentence? I think so. Uh, yeah. So for every user data, you have a different parameter vector that we want to estimate. That's fine. And we sample from the corresponding bear distributions. That's fine. And then we do our max. Oh, so it's really, really simple. And here we just say user alpha. Mm -hmm. And that should work, I think. I probably not. Yeah. <laughs> probably not because I'm not sure about the syntax there. Uh, but that's the basic idea. And how about doing it? Uh, let's see. This is in this format. It's weird format. Yeah. So in principle, you could use a bootstrap classifier, but it's not really possible to do it, uh, to be honest. So let's just try this. Numpy or Python bootstrap sample uh, there should be some very simple way of doing it but don't forget what it is no this works for array data I don't know if it works for data frames run in to find okay this seems to be working right Aha. that seems to be what we want yeah so have this array you can select any column you like So in theory, you could use this one and get a random sample of your data, and then fit any module you like. Oops. And you get the bootstrap distribution. So I'll say um, bootstrap bandit. Okay, so here what we do normally is uh, add data, user action outcome to data set. Yeah, and here you say model uh, fit data bootstrap sample okay and I'm very optimistic here and assume that there exists a method for doing that okay okay and and then you can say more will get best action uh, if you had this okay but then this is still some work to implement this. But uh, if you have a standard model, then you can do what we did exactly in the previous uh, assignment, where you had the prediction probabilities and then you found the maximum utility action for the predicted probabilities, right? So you only need to have a way of predicting this thing here, right? 
the probability of different outcomes given the treatment, you have the reward function, find the maximizing treatment, okay? But now, in a lot of real world projects, you don't have this kind of flexibility that you can actually program a computer to select the actions for you all the time. And you need uh, to actually have a human implement them, yeah? So this is typical in clinical trials, for example, uh, or oil exploration or stuff like that. So you say, I'm going to say, this is how you should uh, do your policy, but then you have to have a way of describing uh, the effects of this policy, okay? So we mentioned the example with cancer and smoking. Well, you could assign people to smoke or not smoke, but of course you have to trade off the risks of doing that against the benefits of the information you learn uh, from uh, the data you will collect. And you don't really know what data you will collect. That's another thing. Mm. So you have to validate your model in some sense against the possible data you might collect in the future, right? So the standard one-step design is this one. So you have some initial belief. Okay, <coughs> I say belief, it doesn't have to be a Bayesian thing. It can be just some bootstrap distribution, in, in fact, okay? Or a set of possible models. And you know that you have some side information X. Now, information X is bold here because it includes information about many possible people you could have in the future, okay? And you take action simultaneously, meaning you assign treatments to everybody at the same time. You don't give one person the drug and then wait and see what happens. Because typically it takes a year or, or something for your for the treatment effects to become visible, yeah? And then you observe some outcomes Y, like who gets treated and who doesn't get treated. Now, typically you care about something like this. That's like your expected utility given the that you might have, right? And that you already have. And this would be the probability of observing a specific outcome given your action over your prior distribution and the probability of taking an action given the data you have. So this is some kind of post hoc value of your policy after you have seen all the data. Hmm? Now in this particular scenario, I think you already have some observations X describing people and you just want to collect the Y's, but it could be the case that you also don't have the X's. So your policy will give you both the X's and the Y's. But in that case, you can basically put all the y's in the x's. You put x inside the y, and it doesn't matter. Yeah. So this, I think, the most general scenario in some way. So you have some initial side information about patients, and you have a, can choose a policy. The policy should depend somehow on the information you have, and you want to measure how good your effect is going to be after you have observed all the data. Yeah. If you don't have the x's, then you could also just take the expectation of this guy with respect to every possible x. So randomizing over the x as well. Okay, now let's do that two concrete examples. The first example is the expected information gain. So when you get some actual data and you have a prior distribution, then when you get the data, you will have a posterior distribution, right? A new belief about what's the real thing. So you can measure the KL divergence between the prior and the posterior. Uh, this tells you how many bits of information you got. Basically. It's exactly this thing. Yeah. And this expression here tells you the expected bits of information you will get by conducting an experiment according to policy pi. Yeah. So this is the number of bits you gained, and this is the probability of getting this specific data. So this is the average number of bits you gain by selecting this policy pi. So maybe one thing you would like to do is select a policy maximizing expected information gain. Yeah. It's not, maybe it's not very trivial to find it, but you can measure the expected information gain of any one policy simply by sampling. Yeah. If you have a prior distribution over models, you can always sample from the distribution. Uh, and you can always sample from your policy as well. You can select actions. But frequently you're not so much interested in just information gain, but the thing is that when you do real-world experiments, you really don't know what experiments you could do later. You just have some vague idea of things you could do. So you cannot do much more than just do a one-stage experiment design. And then the more interesting thing for you is to learn as much information as possible from this one experiment. Okay? 
another thing you could have, which is slightly different, without uh, giving your data, you collect some data, and then afterwards, you would like to have a great policy. For example, you are testing drugs, and at the end, you would like to discover the most effective treatment. Yeah? So you don't really care about learning a lot of information about all the drugs. You don't care about how good the really bad drugs are. You can ignore them. Yeah? Even if you can get lots of information about the bad drugs, you don't care so much. You care about finding the most eff efficacious, uh, efficacious drug. So in that case, you can say, okay, at the end, after I finish, I want to find the maximal, the optimal policy or the optimal non-adaptive policy for assigning treatments. In a sense, finding the best drug. Yeah. So this will be basically equal to the probability of observing specific data in the future, because some patients might be less uh, frequent than others. And this will be the reward of assigning a treatment to a specific patient. So this will be basically the average number of times, if you think about patient treatments, this is basically the average number of times you could treat a patient with policy pi 1 at the end of the experiment. Yeah. So for different experiments, you get different results, different results to different beliefs, and for every different belief, you have a different optimal policy. Yeah. As long as your beliefs, your design is such that no matter what your final belief is, your uh, policy at the end gives you nice results, then your experiment design is good in the sense that it leads to, a, to one of the really good policies. However, you might lose a lot during the trial, so people might die during the trial, but if you only care about uh, getting a good drug at the end, this is the right thing to maximize, right? So you, you have an expectation, so here a lot of things can happen here, so the why can be lots of bad uh, results, very few people treat it, but if you have useful information, then this value could be quite high. Okay? Now in practice again, this can only be done easily if you have a very well-defined model for the y, i, a's and x's. But you could also do it if you have a generative model that is just a program. So imagine you have a program that details how you should, uh, well, a program that uh, has a very simple model of how the world works, but has a lot of parameters, which you don't know how to set. Doesn't matter, you can always set them randomly. You know? And then generate data according to some policy that you select. So these are done randomly generated by your random model, and you have whatever policy you have selected. And then at the end, you can select a policy that looks optimal, and measure how well the policy performs. Or you can look at the information gain that results from your experiments. Yeah. So Sumaya, with Sumaya we prepared this small lab where you will run uh, expected information game results uh, by sampling from some arbitrary model, specific for this smoking, no smoking thing. Yeah. And you will be able to see, well, um, if we assign half people to smoke and half people not to smoke, then we get lots of information about uh, whether or not smoking causes cancer, but we also have a lot of people that get cancer, right? So um, if we set a specific utility function trading these two things off, how many deaths are acceptable per bit of information we get about smoking? Well, don't laugh, it's true, that's basically. Uh, so how much risk do we want to accept for a number of bits of information, because in the end, if we do have these bits of information, we assume that they will help us in the future for doing, implementing some other policy. Let's say, saying, okay, uh, the deaths of smoking are very high, so we need to use some public policy measures to reduce them. You know? But there are policy parameters like probability of taking different actions, how many people to treat, and things like that that you can design before you see any data at all. You know? And this is what you play with. Um, and then also next week, Dick has a surprise laboratory uh, based on